everyone. In this video, we'll consider carrier-mediated transport. And carrier-mediated transport breaks down into three things. One is carrier-mediated diffusion, which is also facilitated diffusion. Two is primary active transport. And three is a, more of a sort of, but it's a secondary active transport. So we'll consider all three of those in this video. So we'll start with carrier-mediated diffusion and we will draw a cell membrane like we have been so that we can take a look at the carrier protein. So carrier-mediated diffusion means that a carrier protein is needed in order to complete the, the membrane transport that we're working on. And you may remember the original example of carrier proteins because we drew the protein in the membrane and then we also drew a revolving door to sort of be the example of the carrier protein. So that's what we're focusing on here. We'll label the ECF and ICF, and we'll also label the transporter. This particular transporter is going to be GLUT1, and it's a transporter that's found in red blood cells that's specifically responsible for transporting glucose into the cell. So I want to just take a moment and explain why we need this carrier protein. First of all, glucose can't travel through the membrane. It's not small and lipid soluble, so it doesn't have the ability to just travel through the phospholipid bilayer. It's going to bounce off. Um, and then it's actually a little bit too big for a channel. So channel mediated diffusion is not an option here either because it's, it's just simply too large to fit through an ion channel. And so that leaves us with this carrier protein that's going to um, basically bind the glucose. So the glucose is just floating around in the ECF and that's where it's in high concentrations. So that's why we drew it on that side. And then um, it'll, it'll bind on the, on the inside of the GLUT1 transporter. And when glucose binds, it causes a conformational change. And so just in case we haven't used this word before, conformation is basically like the shape. And so something that's undergoing a conformational change means that it's changing shape for, on account of something specific happening, in this case, glucose binding. And so now we can actually sort of redraw the, the protein and it's gonna be facing the opposite direction. So what happens is the, the, the transporter closes on the ECF side and opens on the ICF side. And as it opens on the ICF side, the glucose naturally wants to come out of the transporter because the glucose is in very low concentration on the inside of the cell. So let's revisit our questions from earlier. Number one, why does glucose move? That's to eliminate the gradient. So glucose is moving down a concentration gradient from an area of high concentration of glucose to an, uh, an area of low concentration of glucose. Number two, what causes the change in protein conformation? That's glucose binding. And number three, why does glucose need a carrier protein? Because it's too big for a channel and it doesn't fit through the membrane. So while we're talking about carrier mediated diffusion, I wanna just mention one other thing, which is uh, something called the transport maximum or TM. And so basically the rate of movement across the membrane depends on the number of carrier proteins. So glucose, can move across the membrane at a specific rate um, and you know it's going to really just sort of move as fast as it wants to depending on the size of the gradient but at some point we'll get to a place where there's so much glucose and there's just not enough transporters to keep up with the demands of the glucose and so there essentially will be some glucose molecules that are sort of waiting in line for a transporter because there aren't any available. And so that's actually considered rate limiting. So the rate of transport of glucose across the membrane is limited by the number of transporters that are available or that exist in the membrane. And that's something that, that largely differentiates carrier mediated diffusion from channel mediated diffusion because in the case of channel mediated diffusion, we're really talking mostly about um, I mean, I suppose it's possible that you could have, you know, not enough ion channels, but it's less of a thing than it is when we talk about um, carrier, carrier mediated transport. And one other thing I just want to mention really quick is that uh, we mentioned before um, that, that uh, the revolving door is sort of the, the, the marker for carrier mediated diffusion. So we'll just draw that. So in, in, in more complex drawings, we can um, maybe use the, the, the revolving door symbol, um, or we can just draw a single circle with an arrow um, to sort of imply that it's carrier-mediated diffusion. 
So keeping in mind that carrier-mediated diffusion is, is a, a purely passive a downhill process moving from high, high to low concentration, we next consider something called primary active transport, which is sort of the opposite of that. So active transport means that we're going to require the use of energy in the form of ATP in order to transport molecules. And so I just want to mention quickly this idea of something called ATP hydrolysis. So hydrolysis is, is basically the addition of water to ATP and it results in uh, a, the release of an inorganic phosphate from ADP. So our products are ADP and inorganic phosphate. And in the cases of primary active transport, the examples that we're going to show at least, we can actually use that inorganic phosphate um, to sort of um, power the activity of the transporter. And then we can also use the energy that's been harnessed from the, the phosphate bond that has been released. All right, so now let's take a look at our carrier protein. So notice that we're still using a carrier protein, but this carrier protein needs energy in order for it to work. So it's a little different than the other carrier protein we showed um, to, to be the GLUT1 transporter. So what we're gonna draw here is, um, is something called the sodium potassium pump. Um, so we'll just kind of label our ECF and ICF, and this time it's really important because we wanna be able to keep track of everything. Um, and, and the sodium potassium pump it's actually called sodium potassium ATPase. It's called sodium potassium exchange pump. Um, so there's a lot of um, sort of names for it. Um, but when we talk about the sodium potassium ATPase in particular, what we're talking about is an enzyme that is that is part of this protein or attached to this protein that's going to actually facilitate the conversion of ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. So what happens first is um, we can see that the the sodium potassium pump is sort of facing open um, towards the ICF, and um, that's its sort of like starting point, if there, if we if we call it that. And um, the sodium potassium pump is able to transport three sodium ions and two potassium ions, each uh, against their concentration gradients. So what we're going to find is that uh, the ATP binds to the receptor site, and then subsequently three sodium will bind um, to their respective locations on the inside of the sodium potassium pump. So once the three sodium bind, it actually, the enzyme, the sodium potassium ATPase, will catalyze the hydrolysis, so break down ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And what happens is the phosphate actually remains bound to the, to the, the, the sodium potassium pump. And the, um, the, the conformation of the protein at this point actually causes like the, um, it, it makes sure that those, those sodium ions that are in there are now kind of like trapped and they really can't escape. And of course, since we hydrolyze the ATP, we harness the energy. So we have some energy left over from breaking that bond and now we're going to use that energy in conjunction with the phosphate being bound to cause a conformational change in the sodium potassium pump. So, um, so this time, um, we're gonna sort of invert the, 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 the carrier protein, and the phosphate is, is still going to be bound, the sodium ions are, are gonna be bound, but, but once we invert, they're gonna want to escape, um, so they're going to leave, and they're gonna uh, end up on the ECF side, and we know that sodium is already in high concentration in the ECF, so it's moving against its gradient. And then, um, of course, we also know that we have a high concentration of potassium ions inside the cell, but maybe we'd like to bring a few more in, so we'll take two potassium ions from the ECF side, and those guys will bind on the inside of the, of the carrier protein. And then once they bind, so now we'll just have the, the, the potassium bound and the sodium released, um, and, and so the potassium bound is actually going to cause um, another... Uh, series of events, the phosphate group is going to be released, and the release of the phosphate group actually causes the, um, the, the, the carrier protein to assume its original conformation, so sort of returns to its original shape, um, and, and inverts again, and then the potassium ions are then expelled on the ICF side of the membrane. All right, so that brings us to our essential questions, and we'll notice that this time the answers are dramatically different. So this, this first question, why do the ions move? Because energy is pumping them. Um, so it's, it's no longer about the gradient, they're moving against the gradient. So 
Um, so we need another sort of reason to drive their movement, and, and in this case, it's going to be energy, energy from the from the phosphoryl group, and energy from the um, the breaking of the, the the inorganic phosphate from the ADP, and using that energy. And so, of course, as a follow-up, why is ATP needed? Because ions are moving against the concentration gradient. So um, it's it's you know very much the same as you know if you were in a in a boat in a in a river um, and the river was flowing downstream and you were sitting in that boat. If you're if you are traveling you know like with the gradient. Uh, you would essentially just be floating downstream, which is what we've shown with all the other means of transport besides this one. But when you think of active transport, essentially is the same as trying to take, take your paddle boat and paddle upstream. In order to successfully paddle upstream, you have to utilize energy. You have to do some actual work in order, in order to, to possibly be successful in that endeavor. Um, so primary active transport is, is the same in that way, where we're essentially we're, we're paddling upstream um, and so we have to we have to utilize our, our ATP to do so. So I just want to um, for the simplicity of drawing, obviously we're not going to draw the, the sodium potassium pump every time because it would just be insanity. Um, and so we'll draw some abbreviations and I'll just give you a couple of examples. So I'm going to try and be as consistent as possible, but, um, but not, maybe not always, but as, as best I can. Um, but generally speaking, if we draw like a circle um, with an arrow uh, with an ATP, that means that it's a primary active transport. Um, and, and then we have the arrow, we'll sort of couple that with whatever we're moving. So it could be like a sodium ion or a potassium ion or a hydrogen ion or something in the direction of movement. So it's possible that ATP can just move one thing. Um, so it's possible that ATP can just move one thing. It's also possible that AT ATP can move two things in opposite directions. And the two things in opposite directions is a perfect example is the sodium potassium pump that we just drew. Um, so the sodium potassium pump is pumping sodium in one direction, potassium in the other direction. And we can actually, there's a couple of words that we can use to describe that. One is antiport. So an antiporter is a transporter that's moving stuff in opposite directions, anti. Um, we can also call it counter transporter or counter transport. And then, of course, we can also have um, movement of stuff in the same direction. And uh, movement of stuff in the same direction may require ATP and it may not. Um, but, but we can um, mention that uh, we can, um, I just wanted to compare the words. So two things in the same direction is symport or a symporter, um, and it's also co-transport. And unfortunately, like many things in science, these words are often used interchangeably. So um, you may hear antiporter or symporter one day, and then the next day we're talking about the co-transporter um, or the, the, the process of co-transport. And just know that they really do all mean the same thing. Um, antiport and counter-transport go together, and symport and, and co-transport go together as well. All right, so finally we come to our last um, sort of example of carrier-mediated transport, um, and that is secondary active transport. And so secondary active transport is basically a type of transport that's driven indirectly by using energy created by ionic gradients. And technically speaking, um, secondary active transporters may be carrier proteins and they may be ion channels, um, but but they're but one thing that that we'll definitely say, and, and this is something that I think it's good to sort of understand this word. Um, we can often describe it as coupled transport, meaning um, that that it's it's always associated with or connected with something else. So um, so we'll we'll draw a quick drawing here. And we're going to draw two things. We're going to draw the sodium potassium pump, and then we'll draw the sodium glucose symporter. And so the sodium glucose symporter is kind of like what's going to represent our secondary active transport. Um, and uh, and so if we were to just consider that alone for a second, um, this this particular um, this particular um, symporter transports two sodium ions along with one glucose molecule across the membrane down the concentration gradient. So alone, um, it's, it, it really is able to work down the gradient, um, no problem. Um, but, but let's just consider for a second what would happen if we actually, um, so if, if all we did all day long was move the glucose into the cell and the sodium into the cell using the sodium glucose symporter, we'd probably be okay in the glucose um, arena because the glucose is going to be used up by the cells to make ATP. 
but in terms of the sodium, eventually the sodium is going to accumulate inside of the cell. And so when the sodium, the sodium accumulates inside of the cell, eventually it would completely eliminate the gradient and sort of take away the driving force um, for the entry of the sodium in the glucose. And so, um, so this transporter is coupled with a sodium potassium pump. These guys are, are associated, their actions are connected. Um, so as the sodium ions are coming in through the symporter, they're also being pumped out through the sodium potassium pump. And so um, the sodium potassium pump is transporting sodium up its gradient uh, while the sodium glucose symporter is transporting sodium down its gradient. Um, but the sodium potassium pump is responsible for maintaining the sodium gradient. So as long as that sodium potassium pump is still transporting the sodium out of the cell, the gradient is maintained and the, and, the, and the sodium transport with glucose can remain down the gradient. So that is secondary active transport. So it's kind of like, it, it's kind of, um, I think it's one of the tougher ones to understand because it's more of like a composite of like other concepts than it is like an individual thing. It's not like a, um, the, the mechanism of transport is like so distinct. It's more like you, you know, you can sort of compile some of the other things, the primary active transport with maybe channel mediated diffusion or carrier mediated diffusion, and you can just sort of observe in the membrane that, that there's probably some secondary act active transport going on because we have these, you know, multiple things that are, that are essentially working together. And so we'll see lots and lots of examples in this course where we actually are going to draw multiple transporters and then show sort of like you know, three or four ions moving, you know, this way or that way, and then this one ion of, of those three or, or whatever is also moving back out of the cell in the opposite direction by another transporter, so it kind of just sort of like maintains the cycle. Um, so, so you won't be um, necessarily expected to say, uh, to, to, to independently recognize um, the this, this secondary active transport, but we'll point it out a lot and just sort of understand that it's, it's really kind of necessary um, for, for sort of all the transport mechanisms to, to work synergistically. All right, so that concludes our, our description of carrier mediated transport. And um, we only have one left, which is vesicular transport coming up next. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.